welcome to episode 16 of the Busted Limes podcast. I'm your host, Paresh Maharaj, and joining me as usual is Black Belt. How you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. And it is also my pleasure to introduce a, another guest, a friend of the show. Uh, he is the host of the Cinema Spection podcast, a podcast that I have been a fan of for the longest time, and of which I am still a fan today. We have Timothy Lutz with us. Tim- uh, Timothy, I hope I pronounced your last name right. Pretty close, close enough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. People tend to add a T in there to make it Lutz when it's just Luz, but close enough. <laughs> I think I, I think I kind of did that, but I was just like, crap. There, there's only one Z. No. Uh, but yeah, uh, totally fine. But very, thank you. Very happy to be here. All right. So, I, anything you want to say? Or um, not too much. Just um, yeah, I um co-host cinema inspection with my wife agatha we have fun discussing and overly analyzing movies and coming up with bizarre ridiculous theories as to what they mean and uh we've been having a ball with it and we're looking forward to having you guys on the show uh later on this summer oh my gosh yes the i would i'm really looking forward to that and what i love most about your show cinema inspection is that it it doesn't matter when the movie c- comes out they just you just cover whatever movie you feel like you like you've done i've seen you've done the terminator i think you've done well, the subject of our episode today, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, most recently. My most anticipated movie of this year, and I'm just going to be straight up. This movie fucks. <laughs> it, it really does. It's it's everything that I've wanted in this movie. It, I wouldn't say it exceeded my expectations. It lived up to my expectations because it really is those classic uh, what shoot which which era of godzilla movie was it again with the cheesy was the, late show early show yeah. uh, late show early yeah th- this is exactly what one of those movies would look like uh, with modern day technology and budget i think a good way to put it is this movie was exactly what it advertised itself to be yeah absolutely yeah and um honestly tim uh, i know you said uh before we started recording that you were afraid of repeating yourself don't worry about repeating yourself from your cinema inspection episode because I, I i just don't want the conversation to just get stifled in, in oh, any way fine yeah and trust yeah. me when it comes to talking about godzilla the, the you'll have to pretty much you shut me up because i'll just keep going and going oh really so you have a long history with godzilla um, as far back as I can remember, like King Kong and Godzilla were the monsters I grew up with. You know, every Saturday morning here in New England, they'd run Creature Double Feature, and I'd be there plunked in front of the TV watching usually one of the two of them or some other great kaiju movie. And I just can't remember a time not being a fan of them. So this is another one when this movie was announced and when this whole MonsterVerse was announced, like, yes, finally, we're going to get to see them done with big budgets and, and well done and not like that horrible Roland Emmerich one. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, with this particular movie... It was so long where we didn't see anything. There wasn't a poster. There wasn't a trailer. And there was talk of reshoots. And I started to get worried, especially after Godzilla King of the Monsters didn't make as much of the box office. And I loved that movie. So I was so pleased that not only was this great and definitely lived up to my expectations, but that it's done so well. That it's really struck a chord with people and people are loving it and getting into it. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Everything you said is just spot on. But, um... Before we go too overboard uh, gushing about this movie, uh, me and Black Belt, we discussed beforehand that I wanted to kind of let him go ahead and uh, just just hash out some of the boring stuff, you know, like uh, nuance and uh, constructive (laughs) criticisms and all that boring bullshit. Yeah, no, I'm going to be the uh, negative one because, you know, that's so off-brand for me on this show to be the (laughs) one that brings the criticisms. Um, Yeah. Yeah, once you've released your pearls, I'll get started on that so basically yeah yeah go ahead i just said you know this movie is exactly what it advertises itself to be my biggest problem with it is that it makes no effort to be anything more than that and timothy you just talked a little bit about your history with godzilla mine is more along the lines of i didn't really start watching kaiju movies until like within the last 10 years or so and even then most of what i had seen was like pacific rim and similar things like that, but, um, yeah, at this point, I would say Godzilla, like, the original 1954 Godzilla and Shin Godzilla are two of my favorite movies of all time, pretty much as close as you can get to a perfect movie, I think, both of those, and American kaiju movies generally aren't that, like, I think the biggest disconnect I think there is between American kaiju movies and Japanese kaiju movies is, you know, 
I, I think at their best, kaiju movies, you know, the kaiju usually represents something, right? Like, I think most people at this point are at least familiar with Godzilla in the original movie being an allegory for nuclear weapons, specifically the aftermath of um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But uh-huh. um, I think, you know, the best way to put it is that in Japan, kaiju like Godzilla are allegories and symbols, and those movies generally have a message. In America, they are literally just pro wrestlers that people cheer for. Like, don't get me wrong, I love a good old-fashioned summer blockbuster where giant monsters are wrecking shit, but, like, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I feel like American kaiju movies always suffer because they never try to do anything more than that, and you don't see that represented better anywhere than with the human cast. Like, you look at 1954 Godzilla, Dr. Serizawa in that movie is fucking iconic. Just one of the best roles in any movie ever, I think. And, mm-hmm. I mean, every human character in the rather expansive cast in Shin Godzilla plays a role perfectly because they're all, you know, satirizing government bureaucracy. Can you say more than two sentences about any human character in any of the American Godzilla movies other than Brian Cranston and Ken Watanabe? Uh, I can, I think, yeah, actually. Ooh, go ahead. Yeah, actually, okay. yeah, go ahead. All right, well, let me start with, I think, one of the more interesting characters in this new one, uh, the Demian Bershier character, Walter Simmons. And this, I think, was kind of an accident, but it resonates very much after COVID-19 and the quarantine thing, where right now everybody just wants the world to get back to normal. And so much of his character is, now in this world, kaiju exist. They are a reality. There's no way back. Everyone has to live with them in this constant threat of being attacked. And here's a character who's like, no, no, I want us to go back to exactly where we were when humanity was on top and that was it. And I'm going to use this giant corporate behemoth I have to make that a reality and prove that man is, you know, the apex predator. Yay, go. <laughs> I think there's a lot of themes like that about people trying to deny the reality of their situation and the fact that their world has changed and trying to do it through technology, trying to change it back through corporate intrigue and sort of corporate imperialism, which I think is a big theme of this particular movie. So, yeah, I think there's a lot there. And he's just one character in this whole cast that I feel like has a lot of resonant and different meanings in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that actually puts it really well. Thank you for, you know, jumping in with that. Um, But yeah, I think, you know, not to, you know, disagree with you, because I agree that's definitely, I think, a good summation of a lot of the movie's themes. But I think ultimately, most of the characters in this movie, aside from the fact that a lot of them are just straight up idiots, like, they're (laughs) extremely one-dimensional and unlikable for the most part, and in some cases legitimately have no bearing on the plot aside from exposition for the audience's sake. And I guess my thing is it's just, the plot of the movie is a total excuse just to get Godzilla and Kong to fight each other and then to fight Mechagodzilla. I, we probably should have done a spoiler warning at the beginning, but honestly, nah. if you're nah. listening to this episode a month after the movie came out and we're worried about spoilers, that's on you. I'm, if you I'm went on sorry, Twitter, you I'm saw pictures sorry. of it. If you go in a toy store, you'll see the toys. It's all over the place. Right, yeah. But, yeah. like, yeah, my thing is, is that's just when the plot of your movie is so shallow, there's only so much depth you can put into your characters. And, like, I think you made some great points about um, the Simmons character, but, I mean, ultimately, that single character contains all of the depth that this movie really has to offer. And, I mean... If my biggest gripe with this movie is um the Ren Sarazawa character, who yeah. character should be in air quotes because I'm gonna be straight up, he's a fucking token Asian that gets killed off with less than five lines of dialogue because yep. what more can we expect from American movies at this point? Like, mm-hmm. here's my frustration with this character. If you wanted to have an actual human plot that matters, when I say a human plot that matters, I mean have human characters go on a journey and actually like learn something about themselves that matters in the greater context of this world, rather than just be- having each human be an instrument to make Kong and Godzilla get from one place to another to fight each other. This was the character to do that with, because, I mean, they talk about this in like the marketing and like in his cast interviews and stuff, there, there, was, there was so much potential with this character being the son of Ken Watanabe's Sarah, Sarazawa character and the idea that you know for whatever reason he was disillusioned with his father's goals or with kaiju as a whole and you know he went a different route he didn't want to you know revere and respect these creatures he wanted to build Mechagodzilla and take them down a peg there's so much you can do with that character but not only do they not even directly mention his connection to Sarazawa from the previous movie they literally call him by name I think once but he 
he pilots Mechagodzilla in one scene and then right before the final battle is immediately electrocuted and killed. He does nothing, and it is just so frustrating to me that in a movie that is an American adaptation of a Japanese franchise, they cast one Japanese character and killed him off with no fanfare and no overall contribution to the plot. I, I don't think I'm overreacting to say that that's a huge misstep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, honestly. it's it's funny because uh, when I saw it, I hadn't read any of the interviews. I didn't really know the character, you know, his backstory or anything like that. But I drew something just from kind of between the lines and some of what uh, Oguri brings to the performance that I thought was fascinating. That lo Ooh. look when he first sees Godzilla and he's still just glaring at him from the rooftop with this hate. And I had this idea looking back at this Arizawa character that what Nabi played, this idea of this guy who's chasing Godzilla so much, he probably doesn't have time for his family, probably doesn't have time for his son, and probably to some degree sort of abandoned him the same way Brian Cranston's character abandoned his child in the 2014 Godzilla. And the idea of this kid becoming obsessed with this thing that he thinks kind of took his father away from him. Fascinated and obsessed, but also absolutely hating it, wanting to destroy it as a, almost this revenge for ruining his childhood. And they never verbalize that in the movie, but through Oguri's performance, that's kind of what I get from that character. I do wish they had done more with him. I'd like, I would have loved for them to expand on that, but I still found it, even if it's kind of underrepresented, fascinating. I mean, I think it's fascinating potential for the character, but like, the fact that it's yeah. there in his performance is one thing, but like you said, they never verbalize it, and frankly, beyond sub... Like, I'm a big fan of subtext in movies. I mean, I just talked about how, you know, I love allegory and kaiju movie, but you know, subtext is one thing, but to a certain point, you know, if you don't say it, you're not really doing anything with it, you know? It, is it's Like, subtext is fine, but... The, at the end of the day, like like you said, that's all just stuff you have to read into the character yourself. They never actually say, hey, this guy's dad died in the last fucking movie to help Godzilla, and now he's trying to kill him. And there are multiple characters in this movie who were in the previous movie, and none of them make that connection or even, like, try to have a conversation about that. Like, and there was time for them to do that. Um, Millie Bobby Brown's character was literally in the same room as, um... Shun Oguri's, um, that's the actor's name, um, as Sen Ren mm -hmm. Serizawa multiple times, and they never speak a word to each other. That's wasted potential. Yeah, and um, good po good points all, ar all around from both sides, but uh, I honestly, I fall on the side of, yeah, it was frustrating that what they did with uh, Serizawa's character. And I think it's such an easy fix, too. Like, honestly, how much more interesting would it have been if he had switched spots with uh, Simmons' character? Like, what if... Serizawa was the one uh, building Mechagodzilla, and he was the and his big villainous speech is a speech about how his father was never was never there for him, so he decided to create Mechagodzilla to destroy the thing that took his father away from him. But and yeah, even even as someone as much as I love this movie, yeah, that is one I do have to fall on the side of. <laughs> I'll punt on that issue of Serizawa's character being wasted. Like I'll give you that one. They definitely could have done more there. I can't disagree with that. Yeah, and yeah. like. The biggest, uh, so second biggest misstep with the human characters, so Millie Bobby Brown's character, Madison from King of the Monsters, mm -hmm. um, Brian Tyree Henry's character, whose name I don't remember, he's the podcaster dude. Uh, Bernie, yeah, Bernie, yeah, Bernie Hayes. Bernie, the podcaster dude, and then um, the kid from Deadpool, too. Um, again, I don't remember <laughs> his name. Oh, uh, Julian Dennison. Julian Dennison. Josh, yeah. yeah, Josh, yeah. They're, they do nothing in this movie. They just go from place to place picking up plot points, and then they pour some coffee on a panel um, during the final fight scene. Like, if you cut all of their scenes out of this movie, all you miss is exposition. And most people going to see this movie weren't going to see it for exposition. So what do you lose when you cut them from this movie? I will say I like that each monster kind of has his team. That you have Kong, you have mm -hmm. uh, the primatologist um, uh, Eileen Andrews, you've got the Nathan Lynn character Alexander Skarsgård, and Gia, the um, Iwu kid. So you have them, and then Godzilla has his team with Brown, uh, or uh, Madison Russell, and Bernie, and um, Josh. And particularly, I love the fact that Millie Bobby Brown's character, we get the sense that she's taking after her mother. Right. In the last movie, her mother signed up with this guy, didn't really know what he was about, but decided... I have this belief in this thing. I believe in the kaiju. I have to go protect them and do this thing. And she's kind of doing the exact same thing, except in this case, she's right. She's the only one who's saying, 
there's something wrong with Godzilla. He's not just attacking for no reason. Somebody should listen to me and see that there's something going on here. I, I agree yeah. with that. I like I I agree that they made a good choice to have two factions of humans supporting each kaiju. The problem is that it doesn't work as well for the humans who support Godzilla, in my opinion, because with the humans who are on Kong's team, they are actively like participating in you know Kong's safety and transportation and all of that. The humans who are on Godzilla's side literally do not share any screen time with Godzilla at any point in the movie. So it doesn't so much feel like they're like on Godzilla's side as it is they, they think Godzilla is probably, you know, has some sort of legitimate motivation. But again, they never directly motivate or influence the plot in the same way that the other human characters do. And to me, it's just frustrating that everything they do just seems to be, you know a series of poor decisions that let them bumblefuck their way into learning more plot <laughs> relevant information that ultimately helps nobody because again it all of the information they gather is just for the audience's information and convenience none of it actually affects anything else in the movie but dang it i like it <laughs> i mean i'm not saying that anybody can't like it yeah i know like, i know i'm just busting your balls i'm now. just saying <laughs> sorry go ahead no, I'm just saying that, like, at the end of the day, I, I mean, praise you watch this movie with me. If I'm watching yeah. a movie and I'm questioning out loud what is the point of this scene, like, then I think it would be a lot easier to, you know, tolerate their presence in the movie. But, like, I just felt constantly frustrated by everything that they were doing. And also, I'm just really fucking tired of movie subplots where it's like, all the adults are stupid and this one 15-ish year old kid is the only one who really understands what's going on. Why? Why <gasps> is th that? It's just a very irritated trope to me, and I, I also find it darkly hilarious that the main subplot of this movie revolves around a couple of underage kids running off to team up with a conspiracy theorist podcast, or and he turns out mm -hmm. to actually be right about all of his conspiracy theories. I'll admit the conspiracy theory stuff with everything going on felt a little weird. Now, like, yeah. Uh, some of that stuff is a little uncomfortable, but as for the kids thing, I mean, it goes back to Gamera movies. Monsters are the friends of children everywhere, so of course there have to be kids in the monster's corner. That's important. <laughs> yes. So yeah, uh, not to take away anything from Black Bell's Corner, this is why I want to get all this out at the front, uh, at the front end, because now for the rest of this episode, let's talk about what we liked. Yeah, I'll leave my um, good stuff for the end, because I think I've um, hogged enough screen time for now. I'll let you guys handle the positives, and I'll jump in with my own. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah. So, uh, dang, Tim. Uh, where, where do you want? Where do you even want to start? Do you want to start with how uh, how accidentally resident it is that it, this movie opens with Kong in quarantine? <laughs> I know. There's a lot of stuff that accidentally worn uh, becomes relevant. The whole line about drinking bleach. I'm like, oh my god, did they refilm that for this, or that did that just happen to be there? There's a lot of stuff in terms of the post quarantine world that feels really relevant. But I do have to say, I'm not sure if I can totally trust my opinion because when it comes to criticism yes i like to be critical i like to as you point pointed out show that mm -hmm. well this plot thread doesn't maybe really go anywhere this could have had more resonance but on the other half of my brain it's like giant monsters fighting oh my god it's amazing and to me the movie's yeah. success is does the giant monsters fighting child excitement part of my brain overwhelm the other one and in this one it definitely does because this is everything as yeah. a kid i could have wanted it does have that show of feel of Yes, this is absolutely ridiculous. This makes no scientific sense whatsoever. How could humans build all this giant, huge stuff and these cavernous bases and all this stuff? And now we're going to fly to the center of the Earth Jules Verne style. And no, that makes no sense, but isn't it cool? So overall, I, I mean, that just blows away the kind of six-year-old part of my brain. It's just like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted to see. We, we see Kong before we see any other human character. So that just tells you everything right there, like what this movie's focus is going to be. It's just like, hey, we... We kind of got all the human stuff out of the way with Godzilla 2014 and even some of King of the Monsters. So it's the way that I that I phrase it with my with my circle of friends back when we were waiting for this movie is that uh, because this movie was already started filming, I think it was when King of the Monsters was still in theaters. Like I believe so, yeah. And given King of the Monsters' lackluster box office performance, I've I, there's a small part of me that wonders is that the reason why they went all out with this is that. They were afraid that they weren't going to be able to make another one. I, I think so. And I, I do feel like over the whole MonsterVerse, it's kind of evolved from the first Godzilla movie, which is like, this is what it would be like to be a human with Godzilla stomping over you and, and destroying a city yes. around you, to starting yeah. to focus on, okay, in 
Kong and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, we're focusing on the monsters a little bit more. There's a little more personality till this one when Kong is the hero of the movie. He is the main character of the movie, really. He and Godzilla are the characters to the point where now we can have close ups of the monsters emoting and be like, oh, oh, look at that. Like when Kong rescues Godzilla from Mecha Godzilla, we get a close up of Kong looking up going, what the fuck? Whoa, he's helping me. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. And even before that, the. The very first scene with the battleships, when uh, the when the planes are uh, shooting at him, the first the, the first missile that hits his fin, uh, Godzilla just turns and just like, really, you, we've been through this. Why do you do this? The moment during the big fight when he really kicks Kong's ass for a second, and you see him get this big shit eating grin, like, ha ha. What do you think of that? <laughs> oh my, God. that was that's one of those things where it's just like I want to screen cap that and frame it and put it in my office and just be like, yes, this is an actual shot from an actual movie that actually happened <laughs> i want a gif of that to respond oh to every tweet ever you know that i like just like ha yes yes oh i oh i already have a, a gif saved of a uh, cog put, punching godzilla in the face <laughs> and oh my gosh talk about how this movie just doesn't waste time although although yeah I th- as i think as we've mentioned before i think a big reason that uh kong gets mo- a lot more screen time than godzilla in this movie is uh america just doesn't have that connection with godzilla that japan does i was gonna say also i think it's just easier to sort of uh, sympathize with kong because you know being an ap looks a little closer to a human he can do expressions that humans can sort of recognize it might be a little easier yeah the- oh yeah that that's actually a good point yeah <laughs> Again, right from the opening scene, he wakes up, scratches his butt. Oh my god. I saw an edit of that opening scene where they put uh, they put Smash Mouth's All-Star over that. That's like, when, sure. when we watched it, my wife said the same thing. Like, oh my god, this is the opening to Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And, um, oh my god, it's hilarious. So when, when I was watching this with Black Belt, um, there's this one part where... You know the part where he's sitting on the air, aircraft carrier and he's eating those fistfuls of fish? <laughs> and like I, said, I remember, I said this is my sec. This is my second time watching it. So she's just like, "Huh? I thought it's kind of. I think it's kind of weird that uh, a gorilla is eating fish." And I just turn to her and I say, "Oh, that's not the weirdest thing he eats in this movie." Because <laughs> d- even for this movie, I did find it really weird that he like started eating the neck tendrils of that dragon serpent thingy that uh, that he killed at the center of the earth. I thought it was. I mean. There was precedent for that in in Skull Island because he did the same thing with the squid that he killed. But I, I don't know. It just seems like uncanny to me to just to see a gorilla do that because I'm used to like. Well, not, no, I think about it. What do gorillas in real life eat? I think I was thinking about like, like grass or bamboo shoots or berries or something. No. Well, he is a little know. different, and I love it was almost experimental. Like, I've never seen one of these. What does this taste like? Mm, not bad. All right, I'll go with it. <laughs> oh yes, and yeah, that actually that's actually a good little segue to the scene where he figures out what he's supposed to do with the floating rocks, like because you see him thinking in that scene. There's a lot of that of him like putting things together, and and like when he sees the the bloody handprint on the door and goes, "Oh, if I put my hand here, I can push it open." Okay. Mm-hmm. I love that as a character, seeing him put things together. And then there's this idea of this Kong sort of ape society that existed in the Hollow Earth, and that fascinates me. I love. We don't get too many details, but we can in, infer a lot of really fascinating stuff about how civilized and sort of technological these apes were to be able to put together tools. And and then it comes to this relationship they have with Godzilla's race. This idea of well, they were using pieces of Godzilla's to make tools out of and power things. And I, I started to think. Were they like sort of exploiting the Godzillas, sort of like killing them and and using them for this sort of stuff? In which case it's like, well, you know, Godzilla has a point to be angry at this guy if that's the case, if that's in his memories. Yeah, yeah, because it does. One of the jokes that I keep seeing after the movie came out was that it's just like Kong's only crime was being out in the middle of the ocean. But no, yeah, looking at it closely, noticing that there was a Godzilla spine on that axe. It's like, yeah, there is something. And even that little, uh, that little, that huge Ouroboros like Godzilla design that's around the pillar. Like, that's yeah, absolutely, interesting. Yeah. I, find, I find it interesting that you guys interpreted that as the Kongs were like harvesting or hunting Godzillas, whereas I interpreted it more as like in the, like fantasy novels where humans like build a sword out of a dragon tooth. Like, 
the, the Kongs have all, to me, like, they'd always been underdogs against Godzilla, and that was just, like, the one thing that put them on equal, like, terms. Ooh. Like, that felt more like a temple than, like, uh, yes, we're harvesting and killing these things for our own gain, you know? I thought it was a resonance with the humans sort of trying to control nature and, you know, get the upper hand on nature that at some point the Kong civilization did the same thing or tried to. Yeah. Well, we can only speculate because we know as much as the human I mean, characters in the say, movie do. If this movie <laughs> wanted to do us do wanted us to do anything more than blindly speculate on these things, they could have actually tried to explain any of this. I think they wanted to leave a little bit of it cloudy just in case they go further with the monsterverse to explore more later. I'm still like in the camp of I'm not even sure if there are going to be any more American kaiju movies. I was kind of under the impression that like the contract like sharing rights or whatever run out after this that's before it made all the money it did so we'll see exactly yeah we'll see we will see but but for now let's uh, we're just focusing on what we have let's be happy with what we have now oh, and what have we have question. now yeah oh go ahead oh, sorry i do have a question for you guys going in did you have a favorite to win the big fight oh i knew going in that it was going to end with with a third act team up against mechagodzilla so like <laughs> i didn't didn't go into this wanting any one person to win. I just wanted to be entertained. I I was Team Kong all the way. It's funny. I was I was torn. It was like watching your two best friends fight. Like, no, guys, don't fight. But I'll admit, <laughs> there's a little part of me that was Team Godzilla because I assumed Kong would win. So when it comes to the actual fight between the two of them and Godzilla wins, I was really excited about that. I'm just happy that there was an unambiguous winner before the big team up. Like that. Oh, was, absolutely. Yeah. I see people trying to argue that there wasn't. And I was like, dude, they had to fucking restart his heartbeat. That, <laughs> that's not a draw. No, he wins. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he, put, he, put his, he put his foot down on his chest for the three count. His shoulders were down <laughs> yeah. if, we're go, if we want to get into yeah. wrestling shit. Yeah. Everybody who is trying to argue that Kong didn't definitively lose is unironically that fucking Randy Marsh, I didn't hear no bell gif. Like, <laughs> you didn't hear the bell because your eardrums have been ruptured significantly. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Kong even tries to do like the Reggie Bull. You never knock me out. You never. Oh wait, boink, and collapses. So. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, you son of a bitch. I'm still standing. Is no longer standing. Well, let's put things in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Something else I got to point out. I love all the weird little movie homages that are kind of. They're not too obvious, but they're buried throughout yeah. the whole film. Like, the big carrier fight, you get two in a row there where Godzilla has a piece of ship attached to his tail and it's dragging behind him so all you can see is the ship and it's like, it's Jaws. Kong is Brody stuck on this boat afraid of, alright, where is he going to jump out? And Godzilla is, is the shark and all of a sudden, boom, jumps out, you know, right out of the water and scares him. I was like, that's brilliant. Yeah, and uh, yeah, honestly, when, when I listened to you you guys' episode on uh, of Cinema Spectrum, um, I had... A- absolutely no idea about most of these references um so yeah i could definitely attest to that these references they were not distracting at all by far my favorite one is the apparently the lethal weapon reference where kong just pops his shoulder back in place <laughs> yeah oh, oh, that yeah. one's pretty great i oh. mean that's a, that's a good reference because that's cool independent of the thing it's referencing like that's just a cool moment my favorite might be the Die Hard one when Godzilla blows up the uh, aircraft carrier and we see slow motion Godzilla jumping away from the flame and it's the exact same shot from Die Hard of McLean jumping off the roof. Right down to the angle. <laughs> if you're going to steal, steal from the best, right? <laughs> and steal from the worst, or, or not the worst, I shouldn't say, because he'll get into a fight, but when Godzilla beats Kong, the angles are the, exactly the same as Batman v Superman. I mean, all you needed was Kong, you know, saying, save Mothra. And you got it right there. Why did you say that name? Why did you say that movie name? <laughs> That's one meme that I feel like never got tired at any point. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dread the day I'm going to encounter somebody named Martha in real life and just, you know, reflexively scream that out. <laughs> oh, Lord, but because I... It, brief tangent. Um, because of Resident Evil 4, uh, whenever I guess a girl's name, I automatically default to Ashley. <laughs> so I feel you there. But yeah, um, God, they had to defibrillate a giant ape. <laughs> like, if you weren't on board with this movie before, this, and I have to applaud Alexander Skarsgård here because I have to wonder how many takes it took for him to 
to separate his in character realization that he had to defibrillate a giant ape to his out of character holy shit i'm going to defibrillate a giant ape reaction you know what i mean <laughs> we can have a spinoff you know nathan L- uh, lynn giant ape doctor it can be like er with giant giant beds for giant apes <laughs> When he says clear, it takes 10 minutes for everybody to actually get clear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, Do you think that might have been like a subtle nod to G- King Kong Lives? Because I remember there was a plot point there where they had to replace his heart. Oh, I don't know. Do you think? I did notice really? there's a ton of, of references to older Kong movies. Like uh, this Kong has the roar from the 1976 Kong for just a second when he first enters oh. the temple. Or Lance Reddick, who for some reason is in this movie he only has one scene i assume he got cut down to nothing but his character's name is gillerman which is the director of that movie oh <laughs> nice yeah his scene basically got all of his scenes basically got completely cut out because he showed up and i'm like oh oh it's yeah, yeah i like him oh that's it he's gone <laughs> <laughs> and oh my god the references i did pick up on though was the the scene where they're carrying him in the net and then they use the explosions to disconnect it reference to the original godzilla versus kong yeah and of course the immortal eat your vegetables reference yeah <laughs> which let's be real that's the only reason they put they put that axe in the movie i mean yeah <laughs> probably that reference alone justifies the axe's existence do not at me mecha godzilla's whole existence in this movie is like a uh collage of different references to the old mechagodzilla movies the way yeah. he dies with his head ripped oh. off is right out of the original one <laughs> yeah. mechagodzilla 2 it's the same thing with the monsters unite to beat this robot and then there's a huge element of the kuryu one from godzilla against mechagodzilla where that version was built around the bones of the original godzilla and went ape shit if you'll pardon the term and starts blowing everything up and here it's the same thing with the Ghidorah skull yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if we're on to Mechagodzilla now, we can finally get to the part where I start talking about the part I actually liked. Yeah, Go for it. <laughs> sure, go ahead. I mean, yeah, again, Parish can attest to this. When I'm so thankful I got to watch this movie on a streaming service instead of in a theater, because that meant that when Mechagodzilla showed up, I could start cheering like I was at a fucking football game. My <laughs> mind was so fucking blown by mechagodzilla in this movie i was legitimately just turned into a 10 year old freaking out legitimately i want to go buy an action figure of this thing that was he he's so fucking cool like and the thing that i can't get over is that he was legitimately terrifying in this movie like in the scene where right after he's like become sentient and killed um sarazawa and he's just slowly turning around in the background of simmons like evil monologue that was legitimately fucking terrifying yeah yeah. I love when he's attacking the city. There's a moment where he stops, turns almost to camera, and has an evil laugh. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I'll have to rewatch it. I'll have to uh, pick up on. Uh, I didn't pick up on that the first, well, first two watch throughs. Hmm. But it's a gorgeous design. The, the design on it is amazing. Yeah. No. And, and the thing that works so well for it is that, like, I mean, first of all, bursting out of a mountainside is fucking amazing. But like, the the juxtaposition of it being so huge and you know, big metal robot, and then just moving unnaturally fast and outspeeding Godzilla and Kong is just, again, like, it's a a legitimately scary villain, which is awesome. Mechagodzilla literally wipes the floor with Godzilla. Yeah, you can see any kind of move Godzilla makes, not only is Mechagodzilla countering it, but something else on him, a missile will launch, or that little buzzsaw tail thing comes up. He has, like, a dozen things going at once that can counter any move. Those jets that he had on his back to launch himself at Godzilla. Oh my god, that's... How even before he even meets Godzilla, where he uh, lasers the skull crawler in half, it's just like ah! <laughs> to see that he's going to do Godzilla's finishing move on him, opening up his jaws and then blowing his atomic fire right down his throat. That was kind of chilling oh me. My. Like, oh shit! I was like, oh, oh no, 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 yeah. no! Oh, <laughs> then Godzilla, then King Kong comes back and um... yeah, oh yeah, and King Kong Godzilla doing a fucking tag team finisher to beat oh. Mecha Godzilla at the end. <laughs> was just chef's kiss perfection that moment when they each have a shoulder and are just ramming him through buildings together it was like yeah. it was kind of heartwarming yeah. at the same time it was thrilling <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. I, I, I love the whole uh, strategy during that whole ba- that whole final fight which is which just seemed to boil down to which of these buildings have we knocked knocked down with godzilla's <laughs> face right <laughs> oh man yeah. Yeah, they're just slamming him into everything. It's like, come on, at least one of these has to be built with asbestos. 
<laughs> what do you think this is? American infrastructure? Stares it to the camera. I mean, everything else about Nothing. this movie was painfully American. The only reason they didn't set it in an American city is special effects money. You know, this is going to be a solo podcast by the end of this episode, I swear <laughs> to God. You're lucky I didn't quit after the Iron Man 3 ranking. <laughs> Also, honestly, at uh, nighttime, Hong Kong is prettier with the colors, so it looked better. <laughs> oh, no, that was a brilliant choice, though. Like, just from seeing that in the trailer, like, I knew that was going to be a phenomenal fight to just for the set pieces alone. There was that one shot in the trailer where it's it's from inside the building and you see them, and I'm just hoping to myself, oh, come on, don't cut to the human's eye view for this fight. And I'm so glad it was most, it was mostly like the Hong Kong Pacific Rim fight. It was wide-angle shots, you get to see everything, and... Can we just rewind a little bit just to the beginning of that scene? God's, this begins with Godzilla lasering a hole all the way down to the hollow earth and basically calling Kong out. <laughs> he achieved the dream of every antisocial child on every playground in America and literally dug a hole to China through the center of the earth. Yes. I feel like if Godzilla got really pissed off, that could have really grave consequences for Earth's gravitational <laughs> field and everything like that. You know what? We've got to get that Space Godzilla sequel somehow. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Godzilla 3. Godzilla blows up the fucking moon. <laughs> What's up that up there? I don't like it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight up a DBZ a bridge. Stop mocking me! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mm. Man. All this talk, and we still haven't gotten to Gia, Kaylee Hoddle's character. Oh, oh yeah, I'm... the only likable human in this entire movie. I love this What's character. No. What did you say like... Okay, never mind. never mind, never mind, go ahead. When I say likable, I meant I was not actively cheering for one of the monsters to step on them. Fair, fair, okay. There's a few I liked, but she is definitely the most likable. And um, yeah. it's so sad, the idea that she is the last member of that tribe we saw from Kong Skull Island, that they all got wiped out. That's kind of a tragic little throwaway line that Rebecca Hall has midway through the movie. I was like, oh, oh, no. Yeah, that oh, is yeah. so heartbreaking. Like, I'm kind of glad we didn't see it because I don't want to see that. But the two of them have the most beautiful relationship in the movie, the idea that each of them is really taking care of the other. He'll protect her to the ends of the earth, and she's looking out for his emotional well-being. Yeah, Kong and G are, like, easily the best, most believable relationship in that movie. Oh, yeah, just a little kid and its giant teddy bear. It's basically, um, oh, I forget the term, it's the trope of the samurai protecting the child, lone... Lone, lone wolf, wolf and, and cub. cub yep lone wolf it's literally lone wolf and cub with a kaiju shit right if cub had like a lot of emotional intelligence and <laughs> a lot of concern for his welfare as long as just yeah being in, in this dynamic <laughs> cub is definitely taking care of lone wolf more than the other way around uh, yes. and i just love how steely she is that i mean this uh, giant ship in the middle of a storm kong's raging and she's just calmly walking out there like hey calm down it's okay don't worry Mm -hmm. Also, I love that she, like, apparently made sure to learn the ASL gesture for coward. <laughs> I do love that running joke. Mm. Oh, my God. Uh, speaking of the sign language, though, um, you might already know this, Timothy, but, like, for any viewers who, listeners who don't, um, one really heartwarming behind-the-scenes fact is um, Alexander Skarsgård, even though his character, like, in the movie doesn't know sign language, like, in real life, he actually, to prepare for the role, learned sign language so he could talk to that actress um, in between shoots, because G's actress is actually um, deaf. I did hear that, and it's just a yeah. sign of what an awesome dude Skarsgård yeah. is. I also really appreciate that they actually did cast a deaf actress for this role. I definitely appreciate that, yeah. I want to talk about... You mentioned characters that she wanted to see get uh, crushed under the monster's feet. Um, the one that I felt the str wanted the most to get crushed under the feet was Mia Sim My Maya Simmons? Maya Simmons, is, yeah. Is the character's yeah. name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that out. was yeah. a big catharsis moment when she finally got crushed. My biggest oh my laughs goodness. of the movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He he takes the time to... Kong took the time to actually check and make sure that it was actually her in there and then just casually crushes it like a soda can and shakes it. And I just love those little details in the animation that, that they add up to something really awesome and beautiful. See, it's funny. I almost interpret it differently because they're shooting at him and it doesn't look like it's hurting him, just annoying him. I almost thought he thought it was like a bug. Like, what is this? 
huh. And then he just smashes it and just brushes his hand on mm. his fur like, eh, took care of that. Moving on, let's kill this giant lizard. <laughs> No, let me let me climb up this hole now to go face this lizard who looked at me funny and almost drowned me. Yeah, I think the best part of any kaiju movie, like that's you know this kind of kaiju movie, is when the character that's been like actively openly hostile towards the kaiju finally just gets crushed. Like the reminder, <laughs> mm-hmm. like your puny human power hierarchy has no power here. It's like um, <laughs> Charles Grodin getting squashed in the 76 Kong. Like, you're just waiting for this guy to get it. When he finally does, it's like, yes, finally, good. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> oh, man. Whew. So, um, yeah, uh, kind of reaching our closing point here. So uh, what, what I would just want to send off with is uh, what hopes do you all have for the mo- future of the MonsterVerse? Um, and let's start with uh, Tim. Let's start with Tim. Monster Island. We need Monster Island, damn it. We need a big yes. island with a whole bunch of monsters. Get Anguirus in there. Get Gorosaurus, because he's ridiculous. Get Manda. Get as many of them as you can in there. Um, as for monsters, other monsters I'd like to see, I'd love to see them do... I, they probably won't, because it's a weird movie, but Biolante, that sort of half Godzilla, half Rose, yeah. half weird DNA mix, because that thing creeped me the hell out as a kid. And uh, because it fits mm-hmm. the environmental themes, bring Hedorah back. I was just about to say that. Yeah, it was like I got Biolante confused with Hedora because I recently re I recently watched uh, the Hedora one and yeah, that's uh, Hedora. Yeah, Hedora and Biolante. Um, and just I would like to see just for the nostalgia factor, just for the fact that he was the first one the, to ever fight Godzilla. I want to see Anguirus. Oh, like come on! I'd love to see Anguirus. We got like a peek at like an Anguirus corpse in King of the Monsters, which bummed me the hell out. But let's see him back alive. Yeah. Let's have him doing stuff. How about you, Black Belt? So, if the MonsterVerse is continuing, my dream MonsterVerse movie is Mothra versus Batra, um, with the main character being um, Zhang Ziyi's Dr. Chen character from King of the Monsters coming back as the main character. And, like, I, I just kind of envision that as being just, like, a full, wholehearted tribute to, like, the original Mothra and Mothra versus Godzilla movies. Like, I, I want this to, like, fucking take place in Japan. That's how much of a, like, homage to it I want to be. Like, I think that... Because, I mean, like, we talked about this earlier, Mothra was the first monster to beat Godzilla in the fight, and, like, mm-hmm. she has her evil brother, Batra, she has a built-in rival to fight in that movie, like, let's fucking go for it. It, it kills me when I heard that Zhang Zhi actually filmed a scene for this movie that got cut out, and I later heard it was, yeah. like, a, a post-credits tag of another Mothra being born, it's like, no, let's see that, goddammit, bring us, yeah. you're absolutely right, bring us back, Mothra. Yeah, also, like, if you're going to try and, like, reference the twins, like, the Mothra twins... Just cast actual twins. Like, like, I understand why they would try to do, like, the double role thing, but, like, how hard is it really to find twins in Hollywood? Come on. There's enough of a market for that that, like, it, it's a thing. Come on. <laughs> I, I get it in the case of King of the Monsters because they, I think they wanted to set, hang on to the surprise that you didn't know the twins were actually coming, so you cast one actress and double her up. I can I get that. I get and, that, but, like... I'm just saying, like, if you're going to do a Mothra movie and you want, like, Mothra twins to play, like, a serious role in the movie, at that point, you have to go the extra mile and actually cast twins, I think. I gotcha. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And uh, my own little self-indulgent bit right here is just, um, my favorite genre of fan art is, I've seen, like, back when King of the Monster came out, I used to, I saw this whole series of fan art that treated the monster as if they were human-sized actors on a set. And it the most of the fan art were just like behind the scenes footage, like Godzilla lying down on top of a set with the with uh, the director Michael Doherty just behind him making a peace sign. Uh, there was another one where with Millie Bobby Brown riding on his shoulders. And um, I just want to put a shout out to all the artists out there. Uh, if you do that kind of art, or if that's the kind of thing, um, send me your PayPal, please. <laughs> uh, I I really like that. Like I even have some ideas. Like uh, I imagine Godzilla posting on Snapchat, um, like the little mini set of the air- aircraft carrier. Like he'll probably post that on his on his Snapchat with the caption, just about to film our first fight scene. Told Kong not to hold back. Then the next snap, uh, five minutes later, is him holding his teeth in his hand uh, with the caption, "Mistakes were made." LOL. <laughs> and hell, look, look, I, and sorry, just one, just one more tidbit. Um. Just show us uh, Kong, like, icing his shoulder and a bird unit, taking a selfie of himself in the sitting in the doctor's office, just like, this movie better be worth it, you guys. <laughs> yeah. 
I have thought too much about this. No, you. Uh, there's a couple other things I got to mention. Yeah. Uh, they just came out with a kid's book mm -hmm. of Kong versus Godzilla. It's like, you know, sometimes friends I fight. I saw that. That is so adorable. Yeah. I've, I got to buy that for some kids somewhere just to, just to give it to a kid. I just think that's so cute. I feel like one thing I want to lean into is now that we know Kong's use, like, speak, well, not speaks, but, like, can communicate using ASL, next time we have him in a movie, give him subtitles. Like, let's have kaiju dialogue. Why not? Like, this movie already, like, moved way closer towards the kaiju being actual, like, characters than, like, the other American kaiju movies. Like, why not actually, like, have him, like, you know, because you don't necessarily need to just have another character narrating what the ASL is. Just have subtitles. We started to get it towards the end when he's in the Hollow Earth and he actually signs home and it's it's subtitled for us. So yeah, yeah. just continue along that and keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, basically mm. we need to get to a point where kaiju can be delivering one-liners as they're beating each other off. That's the <laughs> ideal existence. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> All right, kaiju one-liners. Oh man. All right. Um, so yeah, just uh, closing thoughts. Uh, it seems that uh, me and Tim, at least, love this movie to death. Uh, Black Belt likes it with some reservations. Um, but yeah, I I've already decided that I'm going to buy the Blu-ray of this fucking thing. So yeah, it, it gets my highest recommendation. Uh, me too. I think I'm going to be hard pressed to have another movie take over as my favorite of the year after this. And the same thing happened with King of the Monsters. It just, it brought me back to childhood in a way where I literally teared up watching bits of this movie. I was so happy. Yeah. The, yeah. the only movies this year that I think I have a chance to dethrone this one are um, Mortal Kombat and Suicide Squad. Oh my God. Yes. That does look good. I'll, I'll also throw in maybe Dune. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. And then the sleeper hit, the Green Knight, comes out of nowhere. And <laughs> takes oh, the shit. Throne. That's still coming out this yeah, year. Yeah, I forgot about it, too. Yeah. You forgot about it, too? <laughs> I, did. I did. Well, with everything happening, you know, everything got shoved inside. Oh, Honestly, I've lost yeah. track of which movies are actually still coming out this year and which ones have been delayed again. Me, too. Yeah. Like, like I just don't know if movies actually exist until, like, I'm invited to go see them. And I'm like, okay, I guess yeah. this is happening. One thing I do yeah. have to mention... Apparently Black Widow is still happening. Too. Yeah, yeah, thank God for that. One thing I do have to mention, because it's still somewhat going on, in the lead-up to this movie, I don't know if you guys follow, there's two Twitter accounts. One, uh, Kong is King, and the other one's Godzilla Says, and they're both parody accounts pretending to be the monsters. And their trash-talking in the lead-up to this movie being released was absolutely amazing. They would just play all these pranks and oh my. send each other insulting memes. It's, it's incredible. They're still doing it to some degree, so... If you get the chance to look over some of that, it's pretty great. Oh my god, I'll definitely look that up. That sounds awesome. What, what was it? Again? Godzilla says in Kong is king. Yep. All right, writing that down. Okay. All right. Well, um, how, how, Tim, how do you usually sign off cinema spectrum again? That ends the discussion, but not the conversation. That's it. Well, you remember it better than I usually do when yep. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> Oh boy, but yeah, so yeah, that those are all of our thoughts on Godzilla vs. Kong, so now is the time for the plugs. Uh, Tim, do you just want to remind everyone where they can find you? Uh, yeah, our show is at www.cinemaspection.com, we're also on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Podbean, a whole bunch of the services. Um, I guess I can announce it now, we're actually working on creating a new podcast, well, it's, well actually it's previously been announced, but we're about to start a new podcast that's going to be reviewing Riverdale the TV show because we've had a lot of fun with that show so we're looking forward to getting into that one soon it's going to be called Murder Mystery Milkshakes so keep an eye out for that one all right and as usual the the name of the our show is Busted Limes you could follow us on Twitter at Busted Limes you could follow me uh Parish Maharaj at noblekind92 and Black Belt what's your Twitter handle again uh, my Twitter handle is at Black Belt 1998 uh, also I um, recorded a guest spot with the Film Rescue show earlier this week. Um, we talked about the Percy Jackson movie adaptation and how terrible that was. So if you want to hear me talk about one of my favorite book series of all time and one of the worst, worst movies I've ever seen, definitely give them a check out at uh, the Film Rescue show. I should also mention my Twitter is Timosaurus R if you want to follow me, and it's just Cinema Spection for the uh, account for the podcast. All right. Okay, so to Tim and to all of our listeners, thank you for busting a line with us. Mm -hmm.